This activity is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hi everyone, my name is Bombay Hurt and I am the program coordinator of Mo Museum. We began in 2015 and have since dedicated to preserving Hmong history, arts, and culture. Hmong Museum exists to acknowledge and recognize all things Hmong, including personal and family histories, traditional knowledge, current issues, and so much more. In honor of Asian American Heritage Month, we are featuring Hmong artists, writers, and filmmakers. Please follow along with the readings in our digital zine. We thank everyone for attending the virtual reading event today, and we hope you enjoy it. Hello everyone. Again, my name is Bombay, and I will be facilitating tonight's event. Tonight's event isn't just to celebrate Asian American Heritage Month, but also Hmong American Day. Let me know in the comments what you plan to do tomorrow to celebrate Hmong American Day. As for Hmong Museum, we will be celebrating it with the community and other organizations at Phelan Lake. See in the link to join us. Okay, how about we get this event started? Again, thank you so much for being patient with us as we navigate this uh, technical issue. And can we please have all the artists, writers, and filmmakers who were part of the zine comment hi? to our audience members. I'll give a few moments for that. Okay, uh, let the audience know you are here. So audience members also feel free to ask questions or comment your favorite thing about their pieces, okay? Because we love comments. One last thing before we start, if you haven't already pulled up the digital zine, and follow along with the readings by using the link below. You remember when one of the dance moms spoke to you in Hmong? Even though she knew you wouldn't have understood, she asked you if you were going to the competition, even though she knew the answer to that too. You stared at her awkwardly. I don't understand, Mong, you said, followed by an awkward laugh. She continued to speak Mong to you just for fun. You assumed you usually wouldn't let this anger you so much, but you knew she could speak English and she knew you couldn't speak Mong. So what was her intent anyway? You know what she's saying, another parent added. Even now, you still aren't quite sure if he was being genuine or trying to belittle you too. You aren't even sure if she was trying to belittle you. You know what she's saying, he repeated. You stopped forcing laughter out of your mouth and shook your head no. You remember walking away knowing that they thought you were rude, but you didn't care. You added another tally to the small closet of memories in your head of all the times you wished you could have found your voice and defended yourself. But you were only 16 and these were adults. You knew how you acted would have been a reflection of your mother in their minds. You have never wanted to tarnish anyone's good opinion of her. Your mother, you love her, of course you do, just like you love your father. They've always tried their hardest and have never made you do anything you didn't want to do. They are like other stereotypical Hmong parents, but they are also different. You know they support your dream to be an author. You know they'd be okay with you marrying a person who isn't Hmong. You feel bad, so very bad, for being angry with them, for never teaching you Hmong, for putting Barney and Mickey Mouse on as a kid instead of Hmong movies, for only speaking English growing up and never Hmong unless it was to each other. You remember your mother once told you about how hard it was for her to catch up when she moved here from Laos, how hard it was to learn English and learn as fast as the other students in her class. She told you that she didn't want to speak Hmong to you when you were a kid because she didn't want that to be your first language. She didn't want you to have the same struggles. You admire your mom for that, even though you wish she had spoken Hmong to you. You understand. You admire your mom because you can see how hard she's worked. You admire her because she's one of the smartest people you know, despite how little she was given. You admire your dad too, even though he doesn't talk very much. He's just as smart and works just as hard. 
You never stop wishing people would finally realize that just because someone isn't smart in English does not mean they are not smart at all. You are fully aware of the fact that you'll never stop wishing your parents spoke Hmong to you while you were growing up and there will be times where you will still be angry, but you can empathize with them. They are hard workers and great parents who've always wanted you to have your best chance. You do everything and would do anything to make them proud. You think about the teacher you had when you were a freshman, how she once said the Hmong language is dying. You always knew that to be true, but it didn't click until then. You also always think about finding love, finding your person. You think about how scary it is for your language to die. You want to marry a Hmong person so that they can teach your kids your language because you don't have that ability. But then it dawned on you that you could never be enough for their parents. You are not what any Hmong person wants in a daughter-in-law. You don't have the best grades. You have no interest in being a doctor or a lawyer. You don't know how to cook. You have no knowledge about shamanism or any religion for that matter. You can't speak Hmong or even understand it. The fear of your language dying is constantly at war with the fear of being a disappointment for the rest of your life. And the latter is winning. Coronavirus 2020. The deal with this virus is atomic. The war in the heart finally reaches land. The bombs raining hard and dust flying and shards reminiscing to a time when there are only three grains of rice left. Not even enough to feed the chickens. But you don't know this, so you prey on trauma and memories of starvation. Making fun of this virus is all you can do. You want to be famous so bad that you don't care to remember the sacrifices made to be here in this country of abundance. The war here is different. It is not mixing the rice with corn to fill your stomach, never mind that the old and young cannot bite into the tough kernels. It is not digging up dirt from the feeding ground of cows and sheep to boil for salt just so you can taste something more. Here, it is different. It is grasping at the memories of beaten fields and then being beaten after having survived that war. It is being Asian in every sense and proud then scared of what it means when the war here is coming to a head. As eyes scroll for news of the next attack and desecration of what is left of us, you are ignorant to this as you try to go viral. From the outside looking in, it seems like an easy day, right? But not only did we have to meet with students for these check-ins, but now we had to learn how to create digital resources and assignments to support students' learning. My third grade students have never had to do any virtual assignments before, so navigating Google Classroom was new. Teaching how to use the technology was a huge hurdle that we had to overcome in order for virtual learning to be even remotely successful. Like how do you teach elementary students to use Zoom over Zoom? My days were quickly filled with creating video tutorials of how to use Google Slides, Google Classroom, and Zoom, as well as recording each lesson of different concepts we focused on each day. Very quickly, I saw the achievement gap widening before my eyes. Some of my highest performing students were struggling and even began to fail. Every student comes from various cultural backgrounds, economic status, language, and family circumstances. But in the classroom, I can at least try to make it a level playing field. I am there to monitor throughout the lesson, adapt my lessons minute by minute depending on student responses or misconceptions. I can pull students who need a little one-on-one -on -one time or extra practice to go over the concepts one more time. I can grab my math manipulatives or draw a quick sketch on the spot to try to explain something in a different way. With virtual learning, I'm not able to do any of that. So if students didn't have parents or caregivers who are literate or didn't have anyone who could help them with the technology or their parents were working, then those students quickly fell behind academically. That quickly became a concern for many educators, myself included, and lots of discussions began on how to help all students. 
While learning how to teach virtually, I had to juggle being a working first-time mom. I had to strategically time my baby's feedings and pump schedule around my student check-ins, meetings, and squeezing in bathroom breaks, diaper changes, and lunch time whenever possible. I had to make sure my son was napping before I started a check-in or pump after a meeting. And of course, there were multiple days where none of that went according to plan. On those days, I held my baby making sure he wasn't in camera view or grimaced in pain as I missed a pumping session and started leaking. It was hard. Very quickly, I found myself consumed with work trying to figure out how I can reach all my students and trying to create video lessons for every standard being taught. One of the hardest parts about working from home is knowing when to stop working. Even if I told myself to stop working at 3 p.m., work always went past that and oftentimes would continue working even after putting my son to bed at night. There wasn't a car ride to help me mentally transition from work life to home life and separate work from home. Instead, I was trying to do both at the same time all the time. Depression in the Hmong community. As for many Hmong men, they are told not to show any sentimental emotions because men are taught that being emotional is a weakness and that it brings shame upon them. I'm here to let you know it's okay to cry or get angry whatsoever. You should never feel ashamed for your emotions because you are only human. As for many Hmong women, they are told not to be lazy and be a great daughter for the family, because no one would want you, they say. I'm here to let you know you are enough and that you are trying your best to be a better person overall. You should never let anyone destroy what your best is trying to be. Just remember, whoever you are and no matter what your religion, sexuality, gender, and identity is, you are you. There are so many people out there you know or not, loves you for who you are. Across the world and universe, your existence matter. Depression is a silent killer, but there are many things in life that can heal. May not fully and completely, but time is also there to try to help ease the pain. So please hold on to me and others that really cares even if it's hopeless. Because I can empathize that explicit feeling of nothing is ever going to work out. I can't promise you that everything will go your way and work out. But if you just put down the pills, the knife, the gun, the rope, or whatever it is that can kill, and just talk it all out about your struggles, let me and your loved ones listen and try to help it is what we need to keep fighting and pushing forward through the dark tunnels and battles. Just know whatever is trying to stop you and bring you down, I'm here and here to let you know that you are cared, loved, and more than enough, my beautiful friend, you matter. Next, I will be reading three creative pieces for the artists and writers who asked me to read on their behalf because they really wanted to be part of this event. Unfinished Sample by Mai Tsing Chang. One too many thoughts, too many to keep up with. Everything unfinished, but still tainted. Some start in the beginning, in the middle, while other thoughts have an ending with no beginning at all. Clouded thoughts with clouded realities, forming from unfinished words, roaming in my mind, unable to articulate a finished reality but just enough words to convey unfinished samples, 
just like this poem, unfinished. Moving on, we'll be doing Be uh, Becky Lee's piece by called Survive. We were all bound at home. I was stuck in my own pressure under death of fear for time and failure. Fear of another year wasted. Failure and success then to hear you're just playing. Do something more important. Painting and sewing became time-consuming and calming. I realized I was using the same art my ancestors used, ditching. A canvas in modern minimalist line art, itch, and acrylic. There's water dripping because I believe Hmong people flow like water. We have always been flexible in mind and body. I believe it is a skill we developed to survive. Moving on, we'll do Deadline Nightmare by Elena Yang. During the pandemic, as a college student, I struggled to meet deadlines, overloaded homework, and my job. When I finished all my projects and submitted things on time, I would just relax my mind from all the work and projects. I want to show my struggles and turn it into an art form where I show a girl who is taking a nap is having a deadline nightmare of the upcoming works after the submission. Tang Chan Tang Tan Chang 
造用造，在竹林落，香味罗林，多吉多浪，用用才高高，单罗林多多浪，寂寞。但一零土土路零零南零在路路高门才高高，但我家高南朝南在。早用早，咱住在龙东一路林，多吉多浪，永永才高高，单路林多多浪，寂寞。但一零土土路来临，南林在路路龙门才高高，但我家路来等路路等哟。人住在龙少路林，东军军才高高，但路林多么土杂。少给谁路在路上出风出就还看中才高高，但保姆才高高，但我家路的。登路路登有钱，住在龙高住路林，都单才高高，单进住路林，都拉车上才高高，单住路林，都单才高高，单海一山牛板。长路到多处，古代你来去，大路茫茫，山崖劈开江，路长一路人都要打工，中餐高高，单山下班。长路到多竹路林，多农忙才高好，但哦。It's me again, everyone. We're going to take a five-minute intermission. Take this time to refill your popcorn, put your laundry away if you're folding it or whatever. We will be taking this break to thank our sponsors. Follow their pages in the comments below, and don't go too far.
I slipped up, maybe I didn't know enough Some things are better left unsaid, but I've not said enough and All I know is we shouldn't let this go We'll be forever tripping over everything we throw But I want you and I want you to know If this house burns to the ground into ashes We will hold it together We will hold it together and If this world starts to break your heart into pieces I will make you feel better And try to put you back together Oh, oh, oh Always on the table So tell me if you're able To see me like I see you Every time you wake up Well this is the bed we made I know it's a little strange Just give me all your aches and pains And I'll do the same and If this house burns to the ground into ashes We will hold it together We will hold it together If this world starts to break your heart into pieces I will make you feel better And try to put you back together Oh, oh, oh I, I, I wonder Okay, next I will be reading an additional three creative pieces uh, again on their behalf because they really wanted to be part of this event. First up, we have Inasu by Shuo Yang. This piece is a relief print produced from a lineal cut. The narrative speaks about my experiences from the early months of the pandemic when the public was panic buying and emptying out store shelves. Certain supplies were more important for different communities. For the Hmong community, it was 50 pound bags of rice. I remember families running to purchase as much as they could even with the courtesy sign, one per customer. As Hmong parents were ch children of war, it brought back distress to provide for one's family at the expense of others. Moving on, we'll be reading Mask Up, by Savannah Tao. This piece is called Mask Up and consists of both traditional and digital art. I first created a colorful Hmong pattern background with markers. Then I digitally drew a black and white overlay of a Hmong woman wearing a Hmong hat and a mask. With this piece, I wanted it to be about how many Hmong New Year events were canceled or made virtual as a safety precaution to protect our communities and prevent the spread of COVID-19. Hmong New Year is an annual event that many people often look forward to because it's a time when families and friends can dress up, take photos, eat food, watch entertainments and sports, and many more. As this pandemic goes on, I hope we all continue to mask up and take care of ourselves and our communities so that we can once again celebrate and attend Mo New Year in person. Moving on to Penultimate Moments by Tsing Belinda Shong. 
Has your mind ever made your body feel like the walls of nothingness are closing in? Maybe you're expecting an impact of some sort, but really, there's nothing in front of you or beside you. It's all in your mind. It was in the middle of January 2022 when I was vacationing in San Diego when my housemate texted me, you left just in time, we all have COVID. Worried that I might have been in contact with the virus before I left my house, I immediately took an at-home COVID test that one of my friends brought on a trip. 15 minutes later, a negative at-home test verified that I was in the clear. What a start to my vacation. Days later, we were at, at sea, whale watching. I was in waters that merged with the Pacific Ocean, an endless vast body of water. I had never experienced anything like this before. The only time I ever felt alienated as a human being was riding my friend's horses and seeing how majestic and large these creatures were compared to 411 me. As I watched the blue whale and his calf swim among their dolphin friends, I couldn't fathom that this huge sea creature could simply destroy this entire boat. But in reality, there, are, there was no sense of danger at all. Just giggling, peace, and moments of silence as we watched on. I came home to Minnesota and found myself anxious as I prepared to protect myself against this invisible virus, making its presence known to the many lives around me. It was sometime after midnight that I had been dropped off at home. Clorox wipes in one hand, adjacent to my naked hand as I turned the doorknob handle to enter my house. Has living as a germaphobe my whole life made me more scared or more prepared for this moment? I think both. As I entered the silent dark house, I made my way up the stairs to my room, my beautiful, precious room. And there, my bed with the foam top mattress pad that I bought off Amazon for my Benjamin Button back. Oh, how I've longed for you. But oh, how this will be the only night I can spend with you. Because at this point, my housemates were still infected by the COVID-19 virus, and more specifically, Omicron, the new variant, the new bad boy in town. Let me tell you just how bad this bad boy got. For the next week, I found myself lingering in existential thoughts on the air matches in my brother's condo, where we spent time watching a new horror TV show on Netflix. This amped up my brain on existentialness. And if that wasn't enough, I had a hacking cough I developed for my trip. I didn't think too much of it until you guessed it. It made me look like I was symptomatic of COVID-19. Living in times where there is a pandemic, it was tough for people outside your circle to differentiate if you were sick with COVID-19 or just plainly sick. When I went to work the following Monday, I was greeted through text by my coworker that mentioned she had covered for me while I was vacationing. She then mentioned that she had felt sick and had been coughing later the week before. Then she reassured me she was scheduled to get tested for COVID-19 that day. In summing it up, my desk was filled with the possibilities of having been in contact with someone who may or may not have had symptoms of COVID-19. Later that day, when my coworker got her results back, she confirmed that she was in fact positive for the virus. Remember when I talked about the invisible walls closing in on me? Those invisible walls are a depiction of all of the chaos that life was throwing at me. With so many questions going through my mind, I needed a breather. I immediately messaged my brother about how I may have been in contact with COVID-19 or not, depending on the ever-changing guidelines about COVID-19. I'm lucky to say that my brother was fearless, reiterating that I was still welcomed to stay with him. And I'll stop there for uh, St. Belinda Shong's piece. Go ahead and feel free to read the rest of her piece on digital zine. And we're going to be moving on to our next readers. Thank you. The world you painted for me was so terrifying. I was more terrified of the streets than forgetting how to live. 
I feared every single person I passed. I live because of fear. All I am is fear. Just because I'm a girl. In sickness and in health, I was bounded to your worries. With this virus going around, it gave you yet another reason to keep me safe. When I really felt like a prisoner. I am not so fragile anymore, so please let me go. Let me paint my own picture of a world beyond just terrible people. Chando Motenu Oku Chisashan the Glu Chopu Luke Chi Gulukomo Please la Mudo Iko Chopu Goton Nunku Gosaka Kunyonta Gon, then Balija Go outside day Tejamba ยอดาดาเทนเดเดมบอลินอกูฮอเตยอนเดนเดนดกัวฉันตุชอกุนดักกาใจปะปอกูตะกามุปุเตเฮจึกูลูปเลอนดอนไดเตเฮจึ To be all before I am mine. Grief, like all things, began from the womb of everything. When I was birthed from my mother, pain left her heart, and I've been holding it ever since. My eyes are not my eyes. They are portals to a dirt path and napalm sky still wet with death. My hands are not my hands. They are the cloth that carries the breath of my people. My legs are not my legs. They are children to the wind and go where comfort calls. My voice is not my voice. It is the indefinite shriek, the shrill wailing, strung inside my throat an octave too high, forcing the quiet to live inside. I unravel the sound of my heart and it is unheard, still, barely there like a forest right after a labored storm. My body only knows how to serve, run, or die. I ask to live and it says to me, your body is not your own. It is the womb of everything. Pain is still the name given to me at birth. Grief still lives in place of me, holding and holding. Like the earth and her roundness, I take everything given to me. I am not mine. I am my father's daughter, the fallen fruit of a rotten tree, the bud of a lotus flower bathed in ash. I am where the earth and sky bleed cherry red, the blood of the mountainside, the quiet rise of smoke. I am my mother's daughter, the place my ancestors take shelter in, the deep well we all cry into. I am keeper of all the hurt, a body of bones used to light the fire that leads everyone else home. I am not mine. I am the womb of everything. The Invisible Rice Bag Have you had to carry a 50-pound bag of rice from the cardio kitchen? 
My mom used to make me and my brothers do it when we were younger. I'd maneuver the, poly, the polypropylene sack onto my back, go up the four stairs, then heave it onto the laminated kitchen floor for a quick break. Of course, only to empty the rice into a 30 gallon rice container. Now, imagine doing that on repeat. That's what it felt like teaching through the first wave of COVID-19. During a non-pandemic year, the workload is already usually demanding. With the added burden of switching teaching styles to adapt to a virtual platform, worrying about resource shortages, lesson planning, and needing to provide support over the phone to my non-English speaking families as they navigated technology, most of my work days didn't end until 10 p.m. Then I'd wake up at 8 a.m. to do it all again. Some teachers might take pride in working extended hours. I do not think it's healthy for me. Doing so put me on constant edge, even on days where I was supposed to be relaxing. I just couldn't seem to shrug off this 50 pound bag of rice, especially since my home was now both my workspace and my personal space. Eventually the strain took its toll on my mental, physical and emotional health to the point where I began taking it out on my relationship with my then fiance. I sank into depressive modes often and withdrew from him into myself, drank a lot, and created an environment where he felt he had to walk in eggshells around me to avoid triggering another unwarranted argument. It was also the first time that I then saw professional therapy to cope with things that I couldn't control so that I could begin to control my responses to these things. What's improved since seeking therapy has been my attitude towards this invisible 50 pound bag of rice. Instead of trying to carry it all at once, I've gotten better at halving it, taking more breaks, and learning to leave it a little longer on the floor before I need to pick it back up. And most definitely feeling less guilty about it all. My home no longer feels like a cage, and I've gained better clarity at what is worth my emotional response and energy. However, my story is not singular, and neither were my struggles. If anyone out there is still struggling with pandemic-related stress and depression, please take, please take care of yourself by seeking professional therapy. And it's not an immediate solution, but going from little to no coping methods to a handful of strateg strategies can drastically improve one's choices and response. The Distance Between Death and Me by Chua Yang I am afraid of death because I have seen cities die. In the blossoming of spring, when buds bloom on bare bone branches, and rain remedies release from earth a world renewed, the city dies with a curtain call for lockdown. The streets are dried of drivers as the roads are slicked wet with rain and the structures of the city stand like ghosts with hollow windows and doors like eyes and mouths twisted wide. And if you listen closely, whistling chimes of echoed cries carried by the wind can be heard. In one day, the city has turned into a haunted house with cobwebs strewn beneath lampposts and across bridges, hiding in the corners of the world, waiting to be dusted. They stretch from my home to yours, and yet... Though we are connected by silk threads stronger than steel, we are more distanced from one another than ever before. So I am afraid of death, because I realize now that dying is no longer limited to you and me. And that wraps up our virtual reading. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, being part of this event and soaking in everyone's creative pieces. This collection of creative pieces are so important because it shows how we live in the present and continue to heal every day from intergenerational trauma. As a community, we continue to cultivate and flourish as well. In this digital zine, the artists, writers, and filmmakers pour themselves into these creative pieces. They reveal their journeys of understanding their Hmong American experience and navigating the pandemic. So feel proud of their journey and feel empowered to share more narratives and yours. Thank you everyone for tuning in.